on Monday, we talked about various pros and cons of fiscal policy. If you're a Indian, then you think fiscal policy is wonderful, most likely since spending is everything. That theory kills the animal spirits. We also saw that there were some downsides to fiscal policy, in particular the fact that it's slow. Remember, we discussed that fiscal policy, unless we're talking about automatic stabilizers, any change in fiscal policy requires uh, politicians who control the leaders of government to agree, and good luck getting that to happen. However, there is this alternative form of stabilization policy called monetary policy. And that is what we're going to think about today. So, what's monetary policy? Well, let's think about it, first of all, at a very broad level, and how it is that we think monetary policy might be able to provide stabilization in this environment. And then we'll take a deeper dive into exactly how it is that we think monetary policy is conducted. So, when you hear anything in the news about monetary policy, what is it that you hear? Or rather, when you hear that the Fed has uh, raised something or lowered something, what is the thing that they're talking about usually? Yes? Interest rate. Interest rate. So, the first thing about stabilization policy, about monetary policy, I guess, is that it might have something to do with interest rates. So, if it has something to do with interest rates, that uh, begs two questions. One is, if the Fed has control over interest rates, how could it use that control to stabilize here? And that's pretty straightforward. Right? We know the interest rate is the cost of borrowing, and we know that some of the spending that goes into our every demand is financed by borrowing. So, for example, if we're in this recessionary gap, if the Fed controls interest rates, what might they do if they want to provide stabilization? Well, they could try and boost spending by lowering interest rates. If you lower interest rates, you lower the cost of borrowing. You made it easier for investors and households to finance their spending by borrowing, and so that should boost the demand curve. Back. So that's the broad idea. The second question this begs, which we'll get to in a minute, is how is it that the Fed controls interest rates? Or maybe put slightly differently, which is the interest rate that the Fed controls? Now, if you remember our discussion of monetary policy, actually, if you remember our discussion, sorry, of monetarism, monetarist economics, you'll remember that they think that the main determinant of aggregate demand is the credit market itself. And so swings in aggregate demand, if there are any, are ultimately swings that are either due to the banking system offering or not offering credit, or the Fed offering or not offering funds to the banks for them to then lend on. So if you're a monetarist, then you wouldn't necessarily be so focused on the price of the credit that's available to you and me, but rather its volume. And so the part of that the Fed controls is the monetary base. And so we'll have a think about both of these and how they um, might work as tools of monetary policy. And in the monetarist view, it might not be so much the interest rates that should be used to try and push things back towards long run equilibrium here, but rather it's just the provision of credit that leads to things pushing back here. There's more credit available, that means it's easier for you and me to borrow. In addition, it would, on top of it, it would be cheaper. It's just a, it's a question of what's the more important thing? Is it the interest rate or is it the availability of credit? 
And then, of course, if there's more credits, that enables more spending and it pushes aggregate demand back. So, if you want to be careful here, remember the monetary base has two parts. There are the Federal Reserve notes outstanding, the currency, and then there are the funds in the reserve accounts of the banks. If we're talking short run, rapid fire monetary policy, which one of those two are we probably talking about? The Fed can't just inject, I don't know, $100 million out into the populace at a moment's notice, right? But the Fed can send out $100 million in reserves at a moment's notice. All it needs to do is go out and buy $100 million or something, and then the instant it pays for it, that's it. The reserves have gone up. So when we're talking about the Fed providing short-term emergency credit to banks, which they then lend on, which is used to support lending, I guess, what we're probably talking about specifically is the reserves part of the monetary base. Okay, so as we'll see, to some extent there's an artificial distinction here between these two things because um, as we'll see, it's impossible to change one of these without changing the other. The question is again, on the end, the economists might still nonetheless disagree on whether it's the reason that monetary policy is impactful is because of its impact on interest rates or whether it's because it's impact on the amount of credit. Any questions, comments, or thoughts about this sort of um, bird's eye view monetary policy? If not, then let's get down into the weeds and ask the question, how does the Fed affect interest rates? And a good way to frame this discussion is going to be asking ourselves, well, which is the interest rate of the Fed? <coughs> so, there are some interest rates that the Fed chooses in a literal sense. So remember that Way back when we were first exploring how bank balance sheets work, one of the first things that we came across was the fact that banks, when they borrow, could in principle borrow from the Fed. And we also later on discussed the fact that when there is something like a banking crisis and all the banks want to borrow at once, and of course there's not enough reserves to go around, what the Fed does is it steps in as the lender of last resort and lends to the banks whatever they need. And of course the Fed just gets to invent what that interest rate is. What's that interest rate called? Well, a loan from the central bank is known as an official loan. And the interest rate on such loans is the official rate. But remember, in the United States, official loans have a special nickname. They're known as discount loans, so the interest rate on a discount loan, which the Fed basically gets to ponder up, is the discount rate. However, that isn't the interest rate that we're usually talking about when you hear someone say, oh, the Fed raised rates today, or the Fed lowered rates today. And I guess if you think about the fact that this only really matters when the Fed is acting as a lender of last resort, like in super ultra crisis times, maybe it's not surprising that it's not this interest rate that we're talking about. There is another interest rate that the Fed controls. You may or may not know, but if the bank has any funds in their reserve account of the Fed, the Fed pays some interest on it. 
it doesn't have a fancy name because it's a relatively new thing. But that's referred to as the interest rates on reserves. Whoever came up with that wasn't feeling very creative, obviously. And that's also not the interest rate that we're generally talking about when we say the Fed raised the rates today or the Fed lowered rates today. Rather, the interest rate that we're talking about and that the Fed, at least in normal times, is usually trying to manage is the interest rates that banks charge each other when they are borrowing or lending reserves to each other. Remember I said a long time ago that um, banks have some sort of target amount of reserves that they want, uh, or alternatively there's a required reserve ratio, whether it's required or desired doesn't really matter. The point is they want a certain amount of reserves based on whatever else is on their balance sheets. And if they're a bit under at the end of the day, they try and borrow from someone. If they're a bit over, well, they lend it to someone and get to collect interest on it. So again, that is the interbank market for reserves, and banks charge each other the interbank rate. In the United States, again, that has its nickname. It's known as the federal funds rate. And it turns out that is the interest rate that we're usually talking about when we say the Fed raised rates or the Fed lowered rates. And that might be a bit puzzling. Because, well, isn't this an interbank market? The banks are borrowing and lending reserves to each other. Um, don't they negotiate what the interest rate is that they're going to charge each other? Isn't it a market price, this interest rate? And the answer is yes and no. There is, of course, an interbank market for these funds, but as we'll see, the Fed actually has pretty tight control over what happens in that market. That's why they're able to more or less pick up what the rate is going to be there. So to see that, I'm going to represent for you the interbank market for reserves. And then you'll see why it is that the Fed can more or less pick whatever federal funds rate it wants. And what's so important about the federal funds rate? Well, remember, the federal funds rate is basically what a bank has to pay if it wants to get an additional dollar of funds. If the Fed can control the Fed funds rate, and it controls how expensive or cheap it is for banks to raise funds, well, let's imagine the Fed lowers the Fed funds rate in the way we'll see in a second. What does that do? Well, it's now cheaper for the banks to get funds. So maybe some, so that means that they, since they're competing for each other, that means now suddenly it's cheaper for them to get funds. That means those interest rate, lower interest rates will end up getting passed on to you and me when we go to the fund and try to, sorry, when we go to the bank and try and borrow to take out a mortgage or to buy a car or whatever it is. Because the banks are competing, a lower cost of funds for them, a lower federal funds rate, ends up getting passed on to everyone. So when the Fed funds rate goes down, all the rates go down. When the Fed funds rate goes up, all the rates go up, to some extent. So this is potentially a very powerful tool, since, we all, since all of our, most of our other lenders depend largely on the banking system. So this is going to be reserves. This is the interbank market for reserves. So if you're a bank and you want to borrow a dollar in reserves, what do you have to pay? Well, you have to pay back that dollar tomorrow with interest. So when all is said and done, the price of getting that dollar now is the interest that you pay. And I'm going to label it not just I, 
But I have FR to remind ourselves that, again, this is the interbank market for reserves. It's the federal funds rate specifically that is the price of borrowing reserves or the reward for lending reserves. Here. So, since we're drawing a market, it means we want to insert demand and supply. Let's start with demand. Who is demanding reserves? The banks. Right? The banks all want some reserves to make sure that they uh, make sure that they have enough liquidity to deal with whatever customers might come in and withdraw funds, or to make sure their balance sheet is safe, and so on. And what shape would the demand for reserves be? Well, in general, demand curves slow down, right? Because if you make something more expensive, then generally people will buy less of it. A slightly different way of thinking of this might be by analogy to the global funds market. Remember in the global funds market, if you have a high interest rate, it means that certain investment projects aren't worth funding, so there's less demand for those funds. Bank, bank, banks might be doing a similar calculation, right? The Fed funds rate is high, there's certain borrowers that aren't worth pursuing because they're, um, the interest rate they're going to give you is, isn't, or the interest rate you can get, you charge them, isn't going to be high. So, Either way, you would expect a downsloping demand for reserves by banks. Now, here is the key question: What's the supply of reserves? Well, where do the reserves come from? How the how does the quantity of reserves available in the world change? So for this, you need to think back to our first class after the midterm, where our first order of business was to look at the Fed's balance sheet. Remember, what's on the Fed's balance sheet? The first thing that we saw on the Fed's balance sheet is that its liabilities are, or include, everything that's in the monetary base, including the reserves. How does the Fed change the size of its balance sheet? Well, by open market operations. Remember, they buy, if they decide they want more monetary base, they just have to buy some assets. And those assets go on the balance side. On the other side, well, they pay by just creating new reserves. So both sides go up by the same amount. If the Fed decides they want to shrink the monetary base, what do they need to do? The opposite. They just need to sell some assets to somebody. That somebody is probably a bank. They pay. Those funds are now no longer in circulation, and the monetary basis is struck. In other words, the Fed is the entity supplying reserves here, the only entity supplying reserves here, and they basically get to decide how much or how little they want there to be in reserves out there. So we're going to draw an equilibrium federal funds rate as being determined by where supply and demand cross. But since the Fed controls entirely the supply of reserves, as long as they know where the demand curve is, they basically get to pick what the interest rate is, what the federal funds rate is. So when you hear the Fed choosing reserves, sorry, choosing interest rates, what they're ultimately doing is picking the cost of funds for banks and how do they do it by deciding how much reserves they're going to supply to the banks. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I said you know, one tool of monetary policy is interest rates, another tool is monetary base slash reserves. In practice, you can't really change one of them without affecting the other one. Here you can see why. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Yes? How do you The Fed just decides how much reserves it wants to, wants there to be in the world. So they're going to be like, 
So, for example, suppose, so let's back up here. We're in a recessionary gap, and the Fed has decided they want to push back. They want to increase spending, and as we were discussing earlier, the way the Fed would do that would be by lowering rates. So that part is straightforward. How would they lower rates? Well, according to this, they would lower rates by increasing supply of reserves to this market. How does the Fed increase the supply of reserves to this market? They buy assets. If they buy assets, then they have to pay for them. Of course, when they're paying for them, if they pay in cash, then obviously the monetary base is larger. If they pay with new reserves, same thing, the monetary base is larger. So, so I guess um, sticking with the situation of where the recessionary gap they want is they want the interest rates to go down. The way we do that is by increasing reserves. If you're a monetarist, you wouldn't worry so much about this. You just say, well, we want to expand the reserves because we're trying to provide more funds for the banking system to lend. So you'd reach the same conclusion anyway, but it was slightly different. Ah. Any questions or comments? If you were in my 2121 financial economics class, we would then proceed to spend a lot of time discussing, well, where do where does the discount rate and the interest rate on reserves fit in here? I'm not going to worry about that. I think our intuition, this, this intuition is the most important thing to need right now. And remember, these things only really come into play when it's crisis time. So let's not worry about that. Very good. So, so far our discussion has mainly focused on understanding the interest rates part of this. It's all in order to change interest rates, have to change the monetary rates. But, it turns out that in recent years, which of course, whenever I say in recent years, it always means starting in 2008, right? In recent years, the Fed has been doing some unusual things. I'm going to explain the rationale for that. I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you what it's called. So think about this market and this interest rate. This is the Fed funds rate. It's sort of the short-term cost of funds for banks, right? It's the loans that we're pricing here are often really short-term loans, maybe even overnight loans between the banks. And so when this interest rate changes, intuitively you think, well, it's probably mostly going to affect um, other very short-term interest rates. Things like, you know, remember Treasury bills are United States government bonds? So it might affect other loans that are sort of short-term. Uh, maybe credit card interest rates or short-term loans that the bank gives to people. As opposed to what? Well, as opposed to long-term loans. What's a long an example of a long-term loan? Well, a 30-year treasury bill, which you know, the government doesn't pay you back for a very long period of time. Another long year, sorry, another long-term asset that is a bit close to home is mortgages. Most mortgages have, well, I mean, they can be for different periods, but if I were to get a mortgage, I'd do my best to get a 30-year mortgage, so my payments each month are small. So I actually have a 30-year mortgage. The first thing I did when COVID hit and Fed lowered interest rates to zero was run out and refinance my mortgage, which is interest rates rates to zero. So I got a good you know, 28 years left on my mortgage. So that's a long-term loan. And so what the Fed is doing here, fiddling with the interbank funding market, those long-term loans may not be very effective. Now, 
you might say, well, but that's okay because you know, this, this recessionary gap is a fairly short-term problem, right? So dealing with the short-term loans maybe is the appropriate thing to do. And that's fine, except now let's think of 2008. What happened in 2008? There was a banking crisis, but it stemmed ultimately from precisely the mortgage market. There's a combination of things happening there. Housing prices plunged, so some people's mortgages are worth more than their house, so why pay off your mortgage? Also, there are other problems with the mortgage market itself. Um, basically, there were these assets, there still are, called mortgage-backed securities, where you basically package a whole bunch of mortgages together and sell them like it's a bond. And that market went down severely because people had thought that it was a relatively safe market and then suddenly, once all these mortgages started defaulting left and right, people thought, you know what, well, these things aren't safe anymore. And they didn't want them. All right, so anyway, the point is that in 2008, it's not the short-term funding market that is the one that's experiencing any issues. It's this long-term funding market. And so the Fed thought, you know, normal monetary policy isn't going to work here. I really need to somehow support the long-term loan market. So how did they do that? So this is now the Fed intervening in not the interbank market, but directly into both of, the, both of the things I described, into the mortgage-backed securities market and into the 30-year, like longer-term government bond market. So, let's think about that market. So, I'm just gonna write bonds here. Some bonds, the Fed has decided it needs to attack directly. But remember, it doesn't have to be bonds. It's just some market the Fed is trying to target. So it could also be mortgage-backed securities, as I just discussed. That was one of the things the Fed tried supporting at the time. And actually, they did the same thing in 2020 when COVID hit and we stopped going to restaurants and stopped going on cruises and so on. Stopped going to Australia. The Fed decided again that it needed to do this. And which part of the economy was suffering during COVID? Everything, right? Well, tourism, yes, but. It was, it was across the board, right? A huge shock to everything in Africa, particularly in some areas. Tourism, airlines, maybe. And so what did the Fed start doing there? They weren't buying 30-year bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Well, they were, but they also started buying just corporate bonds, like everything. So, so this has bonds that ultimately is just whatever it is that the Fed decides that it needs to target their own. And then this is the price of said bond or said asset. So if the Fed is trying to support this market, it can do, well, two things, but again, just like here, they're kind of both the same thing. One is, if people are no longer interested in buying these bonds or mortgage-backed securities or whatever they are, the Fed can just make up the demand itself. Right. So this is Fed buys bonds. And the key here is that the size of the Fed's open market operation here, well, I guess it's not an open market operation, it's the Fed directly buying these assets. It's not going to the banking system. 
the size of these purchases must be immense, because they have to be so large that they're able to affect the price of what might be a very large market. The market, the market for mortgage by securities is huge, the market for 30 year treasuries is huge. And of course, if the Fed does that and is able to bid up the price of its assets, that's the same thing as saying that it's doing what to interest rates? Pushing them down. So, so in quote unquote normal times, this is a good representation of how the Fed acts. And the Fed's doing this now as well. Right? The Fed is always involved in the interbank market for reserves. But on top of it, in extraordinary times, the Fed can also do this and get directly involved in certain markets by buying huge amounts of whatever the asset in question is to, in this case, lower interest rates, which is what we need since we're in a recessionary gap here. And so when the Fed does that and intervenes directly in the market for any particular asset, that's called quantitative easing. Or QE for short. Quantitative easing is a bit of a mouthful, so of course people usually refer to it as QE. And then after the first bout of QE, at the beginning of the financial crisis, they ended the second bout, which they called QE2. And so on. So, to get a sense of quite the scale of these operations, I want to show you this. So this is the monetary base in the United States starting from 1959 and going on to the present day. And you can see that if you start over here on the left, 1959, there's a slow, gradual growth in the monetary base. Right? we get to 2008. I'm zoom in here a bit. It's pretty clear what's going on, right? Suddenly, whatever the Fed was doing before, which as like I said, can generally be thought of in terms of the influence doing inside the interbank uh, reserve market. Suddenly here, things are different. Between 2008 and 2010, the monetary base doubles, right? That's how big quantitative easing has to be in order to actually get anything done, and that's precisely what they did. And then you keep looking out further off to the right, you see that it kind of peaks in around 9, sorry, 2015, at around four trillion dollars. Whereas when the crisis hits and it started with quantitative easing, the monetary base was less than one trillion. So it more than quadrupled the monetary base. Just buying up, I think it was almost 800 million in. No, 800 billion, sorry, by securities as well as treasury bills and various other things. And then it slowly starts to come down again, right? So the Fed is presumably, I suppose, trying to back out of this position. Remember when we discussed this incident before? We said that in the Great Depression, the banks were afraid of bank runs, so they stopped lending. The Fed didn't do anything, so there was a credit crunch as well as bank runs. In 2008, the Fed did the opposite. The banks didn't want to lend, but the Fed just poured out reserves, and this is how, right? actually in both ways. They both supplied a lot of reserves to the interbank funding market, and they also were engaging quantitative easing, directly buying on certain assets. And you see, it goes all 
area. And of course, intuitively, at some point, you would hope the banking system is getting better, at which point the Fed doesn't need to be doing this and they need to sort of pull back and reduce their the size of the monetary base. Did you do that? It looks like a little bit. And then what happens? COVID. And what do they start doing then? They again double down because there's a huge economic crisis, and they try to deal as they try to deal with it by well more of the same. As I mentioned, they already they're already supporting mortgage-backed securities and treasuries markets directly. They started buying corporate bonds and God knows what. Anything just to just to keep the to keep the markets up, or I guess I guess to support support aggregate demand and stop them from being a crisis. And again, so we're still so we're still in crisis mode. We've kind of been in crisis mode since sometime in 2008. Here's another view of these events. This is the federal fund. And you see, I guess if you take sort of, again, a bird's eye view of this, what's the long-term average federal fund rate over this whole period? I guess it's kind of three or four, maybe, percent-ish. It's hard to tell because there's so many jumps. I guess the most salient feature to me, aside from the fact that something very weird must have happened in the early 80s to have such high interest rates, and we'll get to that soon. The other most salient feature of this to me is that here the rates are coming down, they're going up, they're going down, they're going up, and then here's 2008. They go down to zero, basically. And they stay at zero until 2015 again. Then they start rising a little, that's the Fed pulling back. And then COVID hits and boom, they're back, back down to zero again. So, We've had basically zero interest rates for almost 15 years, with a little exception there before, just before COVID. So, again, that's not a that's not an encouraging sign about the state of the. I guess on the one hand the banking system, on the other hand the economy overall. The, it's, the Fed has felt the, the need to keep interest rates at such a such an incredibly low low level. And I guess I am more or less tiptoeing towards the direction of discussed on Monday, a pro, presumably, is that monetary policy can be changed at very short notice. There's a recent example of this. Uh, you, many of you, I'm sure, heard about the recent liquidation of uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which experienced bank. They were unable to raise capital, which was a sign that they're insolvent, then they naturally experienced a bank run and eventually and are in the process of being liquidated. I bought by some hands the deposits are moving to other banks. Within a week of that happening, the Fed and the FDIC, well, so immediately the Fed and the FDIC were worried about this spilling over to other banks and then creating a banking crisis. So, Within a week, the Fed, the FDIC, and others have managed to get together, which is about, just as we had a discussion with, with fiscal policy about its various pros and cons, it's probably also a good idea to have some pros and cons of monetary policy. So, 
as discussed on Monday, a pro, presumably, is that monetary policy can be changed at very short notice. There's a recent example of this. Uh, you, many of you, I'm sure, heard about the recent liquidation of uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which experienced bank loss. They were unable to raise capital, which was a sign that they're insolvent. Then they ex naturally experienced a bank run and, eventually, and are in the process of being liquidated. I.e., bought by some hands. The, the deposits are moving to other banks. Within a week of that happening, the Fed and the FDIC, well, so immediately the Fed and the FDIC were worried about this spilling over to other banks and then creating a banking crisis. So within a week, the Fed, the FDIC, and others had managed to get together and create an entirely new lending facility for banks. And basically what banks can do is the following. Suppose, and we know all banks do, suppose you're a bank and you have on your balance sheet a bunch of government bonds. These are contracts that say things like, you know, the US <coughs> Treasury will pay you $100,000 in, let's say, 10 years. So all banks have some of those assets on their balance sheets. What this new facility can do is that the Fed says, you can go to the Fed and borrow reserves, so actual cash, basically, from the Fed using these bonds as collateral at face value. In other words, you go to the Fed with a $100,000 bond for, to be paid in 10 years, and the Fed will give you $100,000. Is that bond worth $100,000? No, of course not. It's worth a lot less. Because, of course, the whole point is that you pay less for it, so when you get paid $100,000, you're getting paid interest, effectively. So, what's the Fed doing? It's, it's all, I don't know if it's, well, any banks that are insolvent can then become solvent through this facility. That sounds, I don't know, does that sound good because it restores banking stability? Or is that a concern because you're kind of kicking the can down the road, right? You're just giving funds to the banks in exchange for something that's not worth as much. Excuse me, not worth as much. Isn't it like you, the Fed, taking on the, the insolvency or the losses of those banks? And just kind of pretend that they're not insolvent? No. I guess one can say it appears to have worked. We don't have widespread uh, bank runs, do we? So maybe it's good that the Fed did that. But on the other hand, the, the deep, deep down the insolvency of the bank hasn't gone away. It'll only go away if those bonds I guess, revalue, and so the banks are no longer technically insolvent. When will that happen? Well, imagine 10 years pass, so it's time for that bond to be paid. What's the value of a $100,000 bond that's due right now? $100,000, right? Because the Fed is about to give you one hundred. Sorry, the U.S. government is about to pay you those one hundred thousand dollars. So, I guess what I'm saying is, this facility could maintain banking stability, but only for as long as, but only if we can make it. I guess to the point where all those assets actually are <coughs> expiring. If we have any more banking problems between now and then. Um, the extent of the insolvency might be might be too severe. So one concern is whether monetary policy is just kicking the can down the road, so to speak. Here's another take on that. Um, and for this, once again, I want to draw on the intuition we hopefully have from 
the discussion of the loanable funds market. So let's just pretend this is a loanable funds market just because it has, because what I want to focus on is the demand. And in the loanable funds market, it's also the interest rate that's the price here. So in the loanable funds market, if you'll recall, the way I motivated the demand for loanable funds is I said, imagine that we take all of the investments and other projects that might be worth borrowing for, and we order them from left to right with the most profitable over on the left and the least profitable over on the right. I said, well, effectively, the interest rate, whatever it is, kind of cuts that distribution of projects because if you tell me what the interest rate is, I can say, well, anything that's more profitable than that is worth financing. Anything that's less profitable isn't. Right? Because I have to borrow this and I'm only going to get some return as well. So now, keeping that in mind, remember that as I showed you here, the interest rate has been basically zero for the last almost 15 years. So which projects are being supported over these 15 years? Anything, right? Even stuff that's in the long run, maybe got zero profitability or close to zero. But it's still worth keeping it alive because what's the cost of borrowing? Basically nothing. In fact, you could borrow at zero and then when that loan becomes due, you can just pay it off by taking another loan. And the interest rate's zero, so you don't have to pay anything. So there's a concern that certainly with these massive interventions such as those we've seen over the last 15 years or so. What the Fed is doing is keeping alive firms that really aren't profitable at all. And in the absence of the Fed's actions, they would have been cleaned up. So firms or banks, for that matter, that are, I guess, fundamentally unprofitable, but which are kept alive in this case by extremely low interest rates. You might refer to those, or you might have heard them referred to as zombie firms or zombie banks. So they're sort of undead. There's really no, no business there, not in the long term. But again, low interest rates allow them to just borrow, pay off their costs, and then when the loan becomes due, you can pay it off by borrowing again, because the interest rate's zero. And then when the rates increase, if and when rates increase, the fear is that such firms, be they banks or otherwise, will be killed. And of course, what, what did we see happening? We saw recently interest rates have been rising, haven't they? And what does that do? Well, we know interest rates rising means lowering the value of whatever the corresponding assets are. All the banks are sitting on large numbers of treasury bills, and the Fed is raising rates. That means it's destroying the value of their assets, or eroding at least. Any surprise that some of them are going insolvent? Not really, especially to the extent that they were only surviving in the first place because of extremely low interest rates. So there is this entire school of economic thought known as the Austrian school. And a big part of their view is sort of like what I just described, the idea that governments shouldn't intervene, I guess in this case we're talking about the Fed, the Fed shouldn't intervene in active monetary policy because if they do, all they're doing is supporting firms that were fundamentally unsound. And so supporting them now with low interest rates isn't going to make them sound in the long run. They'll just go bad at some other later date. 
Um, which their view is any instrument, any sort of monitoring quality like this is just kicking the can down the road. Yep. Um, based on this, would you say that higher interest rates can result in directing higher unemployment? Um, higher interest rates certainly result in higher unemployment than otherwise. So I'm just going to sketch this quickly here. I'm going to draw all this quickly. So the flip side of all of this is the following. So far we are talking about what should the Fed do in the case that there's a recessionary gap. And the and there are two uh, there are two answers. One is if it wants to use so-called conventional monetary policy, then it can lower interest rates in the interbank market. Second, if it wants to use unconventional monetary policy or QE, then it can intervene directly in some markets to lower interest rates. The flip side is what if we're not in a recessionary gap, instead we're in an inflationary gap. Well, if we want to get back to long run, we can do two things. One, we can just do nothing and then the self-correcting mechanism will do it for us. Or two, the Fed could try and push the demand curve back where it came from. And in that case, how would they do it? They would have to raise rates. And if they were to do that, then of course they would be, they would indeed be raising unemployment compared to what it would have been, which would have been here. The real problem, I would say, with inflationary gaps, which I guess we'll get to, will we get to it next week? We might get to it after the midterm, I'm not sure. We'll see. Is that inflation inflation is a bit special. If inflation is around for a long time, it starts to become, in ways we'll describe this later, sort of baked into the economy. And then once you start to experience inflation, it's extremely hard to stop it. So once inflation sets in, regardless of whether or not you're in an inflationary gap, if there's something called inflation, there's this urgency to try and fight it. And uh, because if you don't, as we'll discuss later, it could become a sort of inflationary spiral. And that means that once there's inflation, regardless of what kind of gap you're in, you may feel you the Fed may feel the need to, as you say, raise rates, which will have a cost. It will raise unemployment, for sure, compared to what it would have been. But some economists would argue that's just, you know, it's just unfortunate. That's just the only, that's the only tool you have to fight inflation. And yeah, it's costly. But we'll get to, we'll get to that a bit later. Okay? Any questions, comments? More thoughts. Um, I guess there's one more thing I want to show you, which is the following. So I show you the monetary base, I show you the trade funds rate, there's one more thing I want to show you. This is United States labor productivity. Okay? So this is output per hour, going back to 1990. So what do we see? It grows, it grows, it grows. Here it's accelerating. And then what does it do after 2008? To my eyeball, this line here is a lot flatter than the same thing before. You see what I mean? In other words, fundamentally, as we discussed, productivity is the engine of growth. 
what we're seeing is that productivity growth appears to have slowed down, at least that's my reading of this figure, since around there. And that's consistent with the concerns I was discussing, right? The unconventional monetary policy, at least to some extent, keeps some zombie firms around. And well, of course, if the Fed had allowed them to die, well, we don't know. There's, of course, the risk that maybe we'd have been something like the Great Depression, and which, as we know, was an economic calamity. But on the other hand, this is consistent with the idea that all you're doing is spreading it over time. Because, uh, yeah, sure, you didn't have a sudden collapse, but if you're keeping around zombie firms, or zombie assets, I guess, more broadly, over a longer period of time, you're still experiencing economic losses. And then it's rather concerning that labor productivity actually declines starting at the end of 2021. And I guess that this chapter of our collective history hasn't yet been written, so we'll find out what happens. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Yes. What is the y-axis measure there? Like the the y-axis is just an index. They just, it's sort of like with the price level, you pick, you have a measure of productivity, but then you just pick a base here and say, okay, that's gonna be 100, and then you measure it going forward from there. Any other questions? All right, if not, then let's move to our exit quiz. So let's go. First question. Typically, the Fed targets the what? The interbank rates, the discount rates, the money supply, or the mortgage rates? Of course, it is the interbank rates. Second, the Fed does this by choosing what? The money supply, the output gap, the reserve ratio, or the quantity of reserves? City of Reserves. Next. Fungor Hall is doing well. It typically changes the quantity of reserves via what? Discount loans, open market operations, printing money, or animal spirits? These are, of course, open market operations. In a recessionary gap, the Fed should do what? Lower the discount rate, raise the discount rate, lower the interbank rate, or raise the interbank rate. And of course, the answer is lower the interbank rates, the Fed's fund rates. Fed funds rates, sorry. Almost there to lower rates, the Fed should do what? Sell bonds, purchase assets, raise interest rates, or raise discounts. The answer is purchase assets. When you buy assets, the Fed is creating more reserves and thus lowering interest rates. Last of all, type the answer. When the Fed buys a ton of a particular asset, this is called, and the answer is two letters. Could be two. Of course, the answer is quantitative easing or 
W E. All right. Let's see how we did. Hope that was useful for reminding you what to keep in mind in your studies. Third is Parker, second is Funger Hall, and the winner is Holly. All right, Holly. Um, if you want, come up to the front. I have a little something for you. Everyone else, nice to see you. And look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. -bye.